Hello and welcome to IG's Trading the Markets podcast. Over the weekend, the Sunday Times reported that private equity giant CDNR is looking at a counter bid for Morrison's after American buyout firm Fortress led a consortium which made a £6.3 billion offer for the grocer. Last week, Morrison's biggest shareholder, Silchester, said it wasn't keen to support the Fortress offer. According to the Times sources, there could be multiple other bids with the potential for the share price to move up to 290 pence. Joining me to discuss the outlook for the supermarket is Richard Lim, CEO at Retail Economics. Richard, great to chat to you. Great to chat to you. Thanks for inviting me on. So first and foremost, let's talk about this uh, Morrison's potential deal. What are your thoughts on the Fortress offer and whether or not it will be accepted? I think there's um, the fact that there's been some activity in this area, you know, we'll obviously, and we've seen this previously you know, around other other mergers and takeovers, there's going to be a spike in activity around around uh, the takeover of Morrison's now, and we'd like to see some kind of rival bids come in, uh, which we've already seen. Um, do I think it will go through? I think there's a high likelihood that, it, that, that, that this could go through. Um, I think Morrison's has been one of those retailers in the market that's um, you know that, that's that's been stable in terms of um, in terms of just following the market trends. Um, it's been susceptible to the shift towards online, um, given that you know they don't quite have the offer of, of some of the other retailers. Uh, they've also been battling against uh, the continued rise of the discounters, and so and so their their market performance has been you know has been you know pretty kind of underwhelming, if you like, and so. That kind of injection of um, of capital into the business um, and some new um, some kind of new innovative thinking about how they can react to market trends, I think, is is, is probably something that um, is likely to happen. So we've seen quite a lot of changes in the supermarket sector over recent years. You know, the rise of the German discounters. We've seen consolidation with uh, Sainsbury's, NASDA, Amazon and Whole Foods. Do you think there could be more M&A in the sector coming up? And why are the supermarkets being targeted at the moment? I think that there will be more uh, consolidation in the market and whether that comes through M&A or through strategic partnerships and other kind of forms of tie-ups I think is likely. I think that what we've seen over the last over the last decade to be honest is just profitability come under increasing pressure throughout the uh, throughout the industry and so retailers are um, you know the grocers are desperately looking to try to rebuild margin and protect profitability, protect market share in an increasingly fiercely competitive part of the industry. So you know, a lot of that will be driven by consolidation and strategic partnerships. And I think the strategic partnerships is an interesting point because I, you know, it might not necessarily be at the kind of the end of the supply chain. It might be retailers looking to form strategic partnerships further down the supply chain whether that's through logistics or whether that's um, you know even further you know further down into distribution and farming, there's go- I think there's you know I think there's going to be some interesting tie-ups um, further down the supply chain, and I think the real driver through this is 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 because of that squeeze on profitability. The industry is under enormous pressure, and because of the impact of COVID, because of the shift towards online. And that putting further pressure on profitability, given that you know that that model, that channel for the sector is is um, you know is much less profitable than the store part of the market. Um, that's going to be the real driver over the next few years. Yeah, and one of the major shifts that we've seen during the pandemic has been this move towards online shopping. With most of us, of course, spending much more time at home than usual. Firstly, do you think this is a trend that's going to stick beyond the pandemic? And secondly, what does it actually mean for supermarkets? The fact that they're having to deliver groceries to people's houses probably costs them more. But in the long term, does that mean less stores? The pandemic has caused a huge shift in consumer behaviour. And that's been driven by, you know, obviously, lockdown behaviour and lockdown in many ways, in many in many people's eyes, despite the fact that grocery, the, you know, grocery outlets remained open because of fears around the spread of the virus. It kind of necessitated that shift towards online in some people's minds. We did a piece of research that just showed that there's about 40 percent of consumers have shopped online for a retail product that they have that they've previously only ever shopped in store for. And if you kind of break that down by category, there's you know, food is one of those areas that has seen some of the biggest shifts in consumer behavior. 
So this is a new wave of consumers that are breaking down those barriers of setting up online accounts, entering payment details, overcoming issues of trust. And it's inevitable in my mind that some of that shift in behavior will stick. It's just a case of whether or not the shift in behavior will persist beyond you know the impact of the pandemic again some of the research that we've done just shows that um that there's a, you know, a big correlation between people who've tried online shopping for food for the first time and those that expect to continue to shop or expect to um, continue to dedicate a larger proportion of their spending towards online shopping for groceries there's a really strong correlation there but i think it's really important to understand that this is a really uneven picture across different demographics. So just simplifying it, younger consumers are the ones that seem to want to embrace these shifts in behaviour more than older mm. consumers. Um, and we've seen data from Kantar, for example, to show that um, yeah, you know footfall figures have, have been up in recent months, but a lot of that has been driven by older, by older consumers reverting to previous behaviour. The other big consideration is that there's a huge regional divide as well. So in London and the South East, shopping behaviours for online are very different from um, other areas of the UK. And so that will mean different things for, um, for different retailers. And it's not just online shopping directly with the supermarkets. It's actually rapid delivery as well, teaming up with the likes of Deliveroo or uh, Uber Eats. What does that mean for the supermarkets in the sense that they're probably leading to higher sales, but presumably they're the cost involved? Absolutely. Um, and I th- and, I, and this, this relates to the just the general shift towards online. Online deliveries are not profitable below a certain threshold of you know average um, average transaction values. Um, so you need you know, retailers in order for online to be profitable for most retailers. It's really a case of you know boosting average transaction values. I mean, the shift towards online has doubled compared to pre-pandemic levels. So there was about five percent of sales that were online before the pandemic for groceries. That's doubled to around about ten percent according to the latest data from ONS. Um, it peaked at about thirteen percent at the beginning of this year. And what that's allowed is better economics for, for, for online grocery deliveries, better picking densities for in-store or dark stores. It's allowed for you know, better delivery densities. And so it's really changed the economics of online grocery deliveries, uh, which obviously you know, is, is the key component for this. So there's a tipping point for whether or not online groceries can be profitable but that really depends on the models that, that retailers are working from. You know, some retailers are using you know, take a card over as an example, you know, automated robotics, picking and packing and and um, and, and a really kind of efficient uh, um, dispatch method compared to dark stores that some retailers are using or just using existing stores to fulfill um, online orders. So depending on the business model is, is a really different picture. But rapid deliveries, I think, is really interesting because there's an overlap here between the takeaway market and rapid delivery for groceries, in my mind, because a lot of the rapid delivery, final mile delivery fulfillment is being done by some of the big tech platforms, the Uber Eats, the Deliveroo's, the mm. Um, the just eats and so you know and so there's an interesting kind of overlap here between rapid delivery and the takeaway market but I think huge opportunity for retailers who get this right um, because consumers are really migrating towards this they like these types of services and just very finally the latest inflation figures showed that food prices are on the rise again this is partly because of depressed year-on-year comparables as we know uh, because of last year's lockdowns. But I'm wondering if this has anything to do with uh, Brexit as well and whether the supermarkets are passing these costs on to consumers. There's a number of drivers for uh, for inflation, of course. Commodity markets play into this. Oil's um, you know, risen significantly year on year, and that feeds through to food prices. Um, Brexit and the extra regulation you know, increases um, that kind of regulatory burden for retail. So, so there's a lot of costs that are being passed through to retailers. It's inevitable that a proportion of those costs will have to be passed on to consumers. Uh, retailers work on wafer thin margins, you know, in the grocery sector, you know, typically around two and a half, three percent at best. And so they just don't have the fat in the business model to absorb these costs. So it's inevitable that a portion of these costs have to be passed on to consumers. I think we would expect to see more of that to come over the next few months. Richard, thank you so much. It's been great chatting to you. Thank you very much.
That was Richard Lim, CEO at Retail Economics. I'm Victoria Scholar, and thank you so much for listening to IG's Trading the Markets podcast.